Hi, so welcome to this talk today. It's about system deboot integration in OpenSUSE. I'm Ludwig. For those who don't know me, I work for SUSE for quite some time. Now in the Future Technologies team. And uh, recently I've been looking at system deboot. System deboot is a simple bootloader that is part of the system D project, specifically for UEFI systems and leaving out some of the legacy concepts that we know. And um, my task was to integrate it in Tumbleweed, basically, the rolling release uh, version of OpenSUSE. So I will start with a, with a summary for those who want to attend another talk or fall asleep easily. So the summary is that a system deboot is in factory. Um, it's, it's signed, so we even have secure boot enabled. We have images uh, for QMU, for Tumbleweed, and for MicroS. And it's even an option in the Yast installer. So the regular installation image also allows to select system deboot. The integration has full support for snapshot and rollback, just like with Grub. Recently, we also gained a boot reference counting. So when a snapshot in MicroS is bad, in theory, it could automatically roll back. And all that integration happens via this uh, SDBoot util package. I'll explain that later. But first, let's take a look at the traditional way of booting that every one of you probably know. So in today's PCs, that's what I'm talking about. It's all x86 uh, architecture. Yeah, ciao, Thorsten. <laughs> so in, in that model, the firmware basically loads the bootloader from the, from the EFI partition. And then the bootloader, in our case Grub, opens the Linux file system, so butterfs, and gets the kernel inner D out of that. If the Linux file system is encrypted, then Grub also needs to decrypt the, the file system first. <laughs> Bless you. And if we use snapshots, then Grub, of course, also needs to be aware of, of butterfs snapshots to select the right version of kernel inner D. When it has that in memory, then it starts the kernel. The kernel starts the user space in the initrd, and the initrd again has to do the decryption and mounting of the Linux file system. So until very recently, you even had to type the passphrase twice, if you remember that. Pretty annoying. And then finally, when that is done, the Linux file system is mounted, then it can start the actual Linux user space. So with systemd boot, which implements the so-called bootloader specification. The model is a bit simpler from the bootloader perspective. So since we have the UEFI firmware, which can read a file system anyway, we can put the Linux kernel also on the EFI partition. So the firmware in this model loads the bootloader, and the bootloader then uses the existing firmware hooks to load the kernel and the initrd into memory. Then the bootloader can transfer to the kernel. The kernel can start the initrd user space, and the regular tools we know, mount and encrypt setup, can actually open the root file system and continue from there. That means we have less code duplicated in the bootloader. So all this looks support doesn't have to be in the bootloader anymore. I mean, for years, we have this problem that we are stuck on Lux1 because Grub still doesn't support this Argon2 key derivation, some endless story. So with, with this model, this problem doesn't exist. Also, we would like to support more fancy ways to unlock a uh, encrypted disk like with the TPM or with a FIDO key or I don't know, some RFID token, maybe your ID card, whatever you can think of. And all of that can be implemented in regular user space, Linux user space, and you don't have to worry about the bootloader with this model. So that's why we, we, we were looking into system deboot to, to implement that. So first let's take a look, what, a look at what upstream offers us. There's a tool to install it, which is boot control install. You probably even have that on Tumbleweed. If you do that, the tool will copy system deboot into the EFI partition, register it with the firmware, and then you have system deboot. Easy as that, right? <laughs> uh, we wish it was. PCs have system um, secure boot, so that will actually render your system unbootable because system deboot is signed by the OpenSUSE certificate in that case. So to the very minimum, we need to introduce shim here to make it bootable on regular PCs. Now shim only loads load grub. That means we need to have some trick and actually rename systemd boot to grub and then 
Shim can actually <laughs> load system D boot, <laughs> provided that Shim, of course, has the certificate embedded or trust the certificate that, that we sign system D boot with. But obviously, this, this kind of fact is not for upstream, so we need to find a different solution for that. Then we finally have a working system D boot in the ESP. Now, how do we get an entry that boots the kernel and inner D? That can be done by scriptlets. So, our um, the upstream has a tool, it's called kernel install, so that one can copy the kernel to the ESP. And our kernel RPMs conveniently call an external script when they are installed. So, the easiest way is to just replace that script from SUSE module tools with kernel install. And then the upstream tooling will install the the kernel inner D into the ESP that looks like this. So the, the layout on the AFI partition with system D boot is that you start with some entry token, which is usually the machine ID. And then you have the kernel version directory and then in that the actual kernel and inner D. You can have multiple kernels, of course, so they are all in parallel. And in order for the bootloader to know what to show in the menu or what to boot, you have those entries. They are text files with the naming scheme of, scheme of the entry token, kernel version, and a conf. So let's take a look at the content. It's just a very simple text file. Surprisingly, it's not an any file, but, but something custom. So it, it has a title that you see in the menu, the kernel version, then um, some sort key that is used when you have multiple distributions, so it can group them. It puts the machine ID, so you know which entries belong to a specific instance of the operating system. Then you can specify kernel command line options. So usually we would specify the UID of the root file system there. And then finally tells you which kernel and inner D is used. So now those familiar with, <laughs> with SUSE see the issue immediately. There is no information what snapshot to boot. So this would work. So you can use this upstream tooling today and it would boot the default sub-volume, of course, but then you don't have snapshots and rollback. So we need to think how to integrate snapshotting and rollback into this model. So let's take a look how snapshots are created. First at the micro S model, the transactional model, because that has a simpler diagram to start with. So on the, on the left side, we see the current root file system. It's read-only. When we install packages, in this case with transactional update, the system would create a snapshot, read-write, modify the snapshot, then turn it read-only again, and at that point, we would need to add, to add the boot files, so copy kernel inner D if needed, and create an entry. So that means this kernel postscriptlet that I was talking about before doesn't even do anything here. We can't do that during the transaction. We need to wait until we are completely finished installing packages, and then we can add the boot files. In a traditional tumbleweed system, it looks even more complicated. So here we start with a read-write file system. That's the one you're operating on. And if you start installing packages via super, it would first create a snapshot of the current system. Again, no RPM script that's running, so you need to use some snapper hook to actually add the boot files for the just created snapshot. Then the current system is modified. While installing packages, the post scripts run, so then this upstream method would trigger, and when super is done, it would again create a snapshot. And here again, no RPM scriptlets, but you would have to do some snap and mechanism. What does it mean to add boot files? We need to copy kernel and inner D to the ESP. Now, kernels with the same version actually don't need to be identical, so Tumbleweed sometimes rebuilds the kernel, because there's a new compiler, then you recompile the kernel. It has the same uname but the binary is actually different. And similarly, the init ID uh, is not a one-to-one -one mapping to the kernel, but you can create the init ID any time from new user space. So this, this model that we, we saw where there's a kernel and an init ID in, in one new name named directory doesn't actually work for us. And in order to select the current snapshot or the snapshot it was built for, we can't embed that information into the init ID itself. That, that's an idea that, that you could have. Since um, the same ButterFS snapshot could actually, uh, different ButterFS snapshots could reuse the same inner D. If you don't actually change anything while installing packages that is relevant to the inner D, it wouldn't change and you can reuse it. 
And we can't just duplicate everything all the time for every snapshot because the space on the ESP is limited. So if we would, for every single snapshot, have a separate kernel and inner D, we would run out of space quickly. And so the only option to, to specify which snapshot to boot would be to use the entry uh, for uh, specifying the subvolume parameter. Now, with all those constraints, how how do we deduplicate files on a FAT file system? So my idea was to just add checksums to the file names. So if we have a given kernel, we just calculate the checksum and append it to the file name, and then we would naturally refer to the to this, the same kernel if we have the same kernel. And Draycut also has an option to create reproducible init IDs. So if you create the init ID again from the same user space, it will end up with the same checksum. And we would also magically end up with not duplicating the information. And last but not least, since we need to put the subvol information into the entry, we also need to make the entry snapshot, snapshot specific. So the snapshot number is also in the file name. Using an add sign would be nice here, but this is a fat file system, so yeah, limited characters, so it's a dash. So how would such an entry look like now? We have to add the snapshot number to the version, so that is mostly for UI purposes, so it's sorted properly. You can't sort by kernel name, uh, by kernel version. And yeah, the root flags need to include the snapshot number, and all the files referenced need to have this checksum which means the upstream scripts that create those files um, can't do that anymore. Looking at the system DUI, this is how a tumbleweed system looks after a while. <laughs> it's pretty messy, but it works. Um, yeah, in tumbleweed, the, the special case is that you stay on snapshot one, basically, and then it just adds more on top, which ends up with this sorting. It's kind of a challenge. So anyway, uh, how do we create those? Entries and files with special name. So I created a shell script called sdbootutil. I basically created it to re to replace it again. So ideally, it would shrink to zero at some point when we integrate stuff upstream. But I wanted to have a solution that works in reasonable time, and I tried several approaches upstream to to have some concept for snapshots. But of course, there's always discussion and. We didn't really know how the final solution looks like, so in the end I said, okay, let's let's stop, let's create a prototype based on a custom shell script, and then afterwards review the shell script and submit stuff back upstream in, in the way we need it. So that's the hope at least. So this tool can manage the, the boot files, so do this checksumming and create entries for the for the snapshot. So in the end, what it does is it makes a snapshot bootable. You tell SD boot utils just make the snapshot bootable and it would copy the files or create an init ID. What it also does is creating TPM predictions. There's a talk from Alberto, I think tomorrow, about full disk encryption. That will explain this TPM stuff in more detail. So SD boot util implements upstream features that is boot control install, what we saw earlier. Meanwhile, I filed a pull request. Um, hoping that it would get accepted with a more generic method to install the bootloader. It basically does what kernel install does, just with, with our snapshotting support. So again, here the goal would be to integrate that in kernel install. Back when I started, kernel install was also a shell script. Nowadays it's C, so that probably opens more possibilities to, to integrate our features there. And it also implements boot control set default, with the exception that we can set a snapshot the default not a specific kernel. And uh, sugar on top, this is a fancy dialogue-based tool. <laughs> I basically did that because I wanted to see which kernels are installed and missing in the ESP and uh, which ones are stale because they're not referenced. But in the end, it's a gimmick that, that can go away at some point. Meanwhile, the, the scripting is, <laughs> is good enough to not produce stale entries anymore. Yeah, it's actually surprising how many dialogue-based programs are there nowadays, so... <laughs> yeah. So what's what's left to do? What are the conclusions from all of this? Uh, we need to integrate with kernel install, I guess. But then we need reference counting everywhere, so... This concept of snapshots so far is not something that Upstream has in mind. We need to basically invent how to have a generic mechanism that is not SUSE-specific, how to express snapshots 
So Leonard proposed some idea to have some instance ID of the operating system, for example, that we, we could map into the way Snapper does things. Meanwhile, maybe we can just disable the existing scripts and not use them. So that means either splitting them into a separate sub package or finding a way to disable them at runtime and then just call stboot util from within kernel install. Still some basic tools, is, uh, some basic tool will be needed to do some consistency checking, I think, because it, even with, with all the fancy scripts, it could happen that we miss a kernel and you want to know which one is missing. Is the snapshot bootable or maybe Due to space concerns, we need to clean up some kernels in the ESP and later want to make the snapshot bootable again. And then we need to, to have some tool that shows us which snapshots are actually registered in the ESP. Then the UI of systemd boot obviously needs love, so this menu uh, is not, not for customers' eyes, I think. <laughs> so unfortunately, there's a, there's a student actually, um, Tobias, who send a patch to system the upstream to implement submenu support. So it's pretty cool. And maybe we can also convince Steffen to have a graphical UI for systemd boot to be as fancy as Grub. We should really merge with SUSE module tools again. So this, there's right now a conflict with SD boot util. Maybe some of you who use Tumbleweed ran into this problem that the wrong tooling got installed. Sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we need to merge this back so we have no conflict anymore. I think we somehow need to solve the init RD re rebuilding because that's expensive. So we don't want to do that on every snapshot creation. We need to somehow be smart about it. Or maybe we don't re uh, rebuild init RDs at all anymore. So Ideally, we should have the init ID on, on server side in, in OBS, and then we know when there's a new init ID and can just copy it, just like the kernel. So, so no local generation anymore. Or we switch to UKIs. I will talk about that a bit later. But there's also a talk about UKIs tomorrow, I think. Valentin, right? Yeah, exactly. UKI talk tomorrow. Let's see if he has different opinions than me. <laughs> yeah, more to do. We need health checker integration or replace health checker with something from upstream. Like systemd has this systemd bless boot mechanism that determines whether boot was good or not. Um, yeah, that's, that's completely missing right now. Then a crucial feature, at least for developers, is uh, some AB updating of system D boot itself. So I rendered my system unbootable quite a bit by adding the devil project and then you get a system D boot with the wrong certificate and then your system doesn't boot anymore because of secure boot. So it would be really cool if you had some AB mechanism for the bootloader itself in the EFI partition. Maybe being smart and not installing a bootloader if the certificates don't match. Yeah, then I found out that we need KDump support. So I don't know the first thing about that, actually. But it doesn't work. So if anyone is familiar with that, I'm happy to talk to you. And maybe we can find a solution to have that also in this model. And last but not least, uh, <laughs> non-UAV architectures. Uh, no idea. Maybe we need, a, need something like an arm with U-boot underneath. But that is something for the for the architecture specific experts to figure out. Yeah, and I have a few links. There's the appliances in OBS. This is officially part of Tumbleweed, so you can download official images. There's a wiki page describing some of the concepts and how to install systemd boot. Open issues are tracked in Redmine, so if you are bored and want to help with that, go there and pick a task. And SD boot utility is also in, in GitHub if you want to submit your fixes. So much for that. Then a bit of a word about unified kernel images. That is what Upstream proposes. And that is kind of parts of system D boot statically linked into a kernel, I would say. So it has this stub, an, an elf, um, a PE stub in front of the kernel, and then an inner D within the same PE binary. That concept simplifies PCR measurements for the TPM. And the idea was that you have some atomic operation on the ESP, basically. You put the kernel 
and in it are together as one file. It's either there or not, and then appears in the bootloader. But over time, they came up with uh, concepts to load extensions. So in the end, it's not really atomic anymore when you can load extensions. And our problem there, I think, is that Tumble with user space actually moves faster than kernel updates. So we have user space updates every day. A subset of those are initially relevant changes, and a subset of those are kernel relevant changes. That means we will end up with lots of UKIs all the time in Tumbleweed because user space changes, and that will run out of space in the ESP. So I'm not sure this concept as is works for us. So maybe we need a, a more modular inner DN and, and use extensions more heavily to avoid this problem. And uh, last but not least in this concept, extensions are CPIOs. So if you want an inner D that is tailored to a specific host, we need to include kernel modules. It would be kind of silly to always repackage them as CPIO to have them show up as extensions. So maybe we need to make SD stub load kernel objects directly because they're signed anyway. At least those are my concerns. I'm interested in what, uh, what Valentin tells us tomorrow. So, yeah, that's it from my side. Questions? Can I make a test, uh, test install, for example, to a USB stick to, to, tech, to, to just test uh, whether it boots? Uh, I mean, you can do whatever Yast offers you to do if you want to do an installation, but you can also use the, the appliance, basically. It's, it's a QCAR image, but of course you can put the QCAR image also on a USB stick if you want to use it on a physical system, but then it lacks some kernel modules like for Wi-Fi. So, yeah, it's, it's doable on, on, on real hardware, but uh, it's a bit annoying. So if you want to test it, you better use uh, KVM and test it in a virtual machine right now, or use Yast to install it somewhere. Um, can system D boot also go over network, or must it always be on disk? Whatever the UEFI firmware can do. So if the UEFI firmware is, UEFI is firmware, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just that I have managed to make my system unbootable yesterday when they're trying uh, to follow the uh, wiki page. So if anybody wants to take a look at my computer, then. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off secure boot. <laughs> uh, I have heard the back, so if you want to. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was actually wondering, I mean, the thing is, uh, system D boot, right? It used to be gummy boot. and the whole idea was that it's a really dumb uh, EFI uh, stub loader, right? It it's basically loads EFI executables, which is why the, the kernel has an EFI stub. And I'm now wondering, you, you now showed a number of things to be done and things you want to get added to systemd boot. And I was wondering if this is actually uh, compatible with the philosophy behind systemd boot being a just a super dumb E EFI file selector? Yes, I mean, the super dump is a bit too, too basic. I mean, every new tool starts with that idea and then people add features. <laughs> but the, the basic concept of not having the file system driver, for example, in the bootloader is still there. So system D boot will, I mean, never say never, <laughs> hopefully never <laughs> open a ButterFS file system or do looks uh, disk decryption or stuff like that, so that is that is out of scope. All the rest, of course, is like, yeah, but they add features. I, I would argue you could actually do that with grub as well, right? You could just load the grub, uh, I mean, the kernel and the init RD from, from a fat file system, like, yes, if you I, insist on that. That's yes, exactly, that's what actually Alberto is working on. So we we don't copy systemd boot there, but grub, and use grub with the bootloader specification. And uh, yeah, I think our package meanwhile has patches in Grub that read this file system layout that the bootloader specification proposes, and then we can use Grub with this model. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of it. If if you have something kind of simple, then you can write bootloaders that support this model. So 
I could think of even U-Boot supporting this because it's so simple. So maybe on, on a ARM device, you don't even need systemd boot, but have U-Boot directly parse this structure and, and boot directly. No more questions? One more. So, uh, do you already know when we can, when we will be able to see uh, submenus? So, I, I know that there's uh, this patch, but um, yeah, can you do, uh, do, do you have some yeah hopes when it will be done? <laughs> uh, no idea. Maybe it's a matter of bribery to <laughs> get someone to press the merge button. No, I don't know. I think it's just yeah, you need to stay on the topic. Someone needs to keep updating the patch. I mean, whenever upstream likes it. But for us, I think the, the, the real solution is to have a graphical version. Like other distributions have text mode bootloaders and we have a fancy graphical one. So that would be really cool to have that. Okay, then thanks for your attention.